Well, hello, uh, Bible heads. This is Dr. Wayne coming at you with your Sunday morning Power Bible Study. Uh, happy Trinity Sunday. Uh, Trinity Sunday is that Sunday that always follows the, uh, the, the celebration of the day of Pentecost. Um, it is um, a way of us saying that, oh, now that we've got the Holy Spirit, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit in power, which happened last Sunday, um, oh, now the Trinity is complete, right? You got your Father, you got your Son, you got your Holy Spirit. And so uh, since we, that happened last week, it's like, oh, this is a logical time to do that. So our texts are um, supposed to uh, support this. Um, uh, and of course, there's a balance, right? Um, we had that long reading from Genesis. That's what we're gonna study today is the, the reading from Genesis. Um, and uh, the, the, the reading, the really short reading from Paul, uh, uh, but um, they balance, they kind of balance out in that. But, um, I am going to talk about the Genesis one, and specifically, I want to I want to get into you know well how does that make a what does it say about uh, Trinity Sunday, and a lot of it has it, it all it all comes down to this. So, what is the Bible? What is the Bible for you? What is the Bible for you? Well, the Bible uh, is um, essentially a story of God's search for man. Um, it's a human story, but it's one where God is always reaching out, looking for man, trying to gather man back to himself. The creation story is a story which puts out the disjuncture of like, well, why does God have to even reach out for man in the first place? Because, uh, spoiler alert, uh, God actually creates man in the creation story. But then um, there's something that happens in chapter 3, and um, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm talking about the Adam and Eve, the, uh, the Garden of Eden story, and so the rest of the Bible is all about, well, um, how is this creator God going to get man back in the fold? How is that going to happen exactly? So um, when we look at Genesis chapter 1, we get um, kind of like the, 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 the setup for that biblical drama. Verse one, chapter 1, Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, now, the, this is one of those passages where we, in, uh, in the Hebrew class, when you're learning Hebrew, um, this is one of the first things you go to. And one of the things you first learn is that um, there is no word uh, the. <laughs> there is no word the. Uh, uh, the first word in the, in the Hebrew is just the word beginning. Um, and it's in, the, uh, in a certain mode that means like in beginning, like the sense of like when beginning, like in beginning. Um, it's like, it, it, it's, it doesn't actually refer to a, a, a point in time as the beginning. It just basically is saying that whenever it happened that God began creating, well, here's our, we're going from there. It doesn't state anything about like, this isn't talking about like the beginning of time. It's certainly uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the time of creation, but the biblical writer isn't answering the question, well, when did creation happen? It doesn't, uh, no, no, sorry, not, doesn't do that. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. This is a statement of not, of, not of creation, but of the way things looked before God began creating. 
Because the, 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 one of the, the theological points that Genesis is going to make is that chaos, that formless void, darkness, all of that is an example of uncreated matter, uncreated being, uncreatedness, if you will. The act of creation takes chaos and turns it into order. And there's a great theological principle here. And that is this. Anytime there is chaos, uh, wow, anybody thought, is there any chaos going on in the world today? Hmm, oh, yeah. Hard to think of any chaos. Uh, yeah, well, I'm joking. Of course, there's a lot of chaos going on in the world, right? Injustice, chaos, anytime peace isn't the rule, That is an example of chaos. Chaos getting back in, holding sway, as temporary as it might. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. This formless void and darkness, that's all the chaos. While a wind from God, now that word for wind from God, um, that's the word wind. Anytime we have the word wind, ruach in Hebrew, it is the same word for breath. It is the same word for spirit. Uh, oh, didn't we have a mighty wind? Remember the sound of a mighty wind? Uh, last week in the Pentecost story, remember? That's what the disciples heard in the room. They heard the sound of a mighty wind. Well, that's actually a valid alternative translation here. A mighty wind. A mighty wind or the spirit of God, either way. But it's probably because of this, uh, the fact that we can translate it as spirit and even, even if it were mighty wind, it reminds us of, oh, the coming of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. That's the connection with the Trinity, with the Trinity, Trinitarian theme. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And the word for waters there is that, that word for chaos. The, um, the, the uncreated being, uncreatedness, uncreated world is just water, darkness, uh, no order, uh, no, 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 no dry land, no, no life. It's just formless. It's void. It's a, uh, uh, this, this sense of like just a splashing of water. I, just, I don't know, a picture of it. If you've ever seen... If you've ever seen um, a, a washing machine, you know one of those washing machines that you can actually see into, um, like they have at the laundromat, and imagine, imagine just uh, just dark darks being in there and just and no soap because soap would create some sort of like and like it's twirling around, sloshing around with water and it just darkness, 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 no light. Of course, we have a little bit of light because we can see it because we're in a lot of mountain. We can see into the... But that's kind of like the picture you get of uncreatedness, uncreated matter. It's just formless, void, darkness, no shape, no form, nothing, uh, no light, no li nothing living, no life, no light, no life. Ah, so what happens here in verse 3? This is where order starts to her. Then God said, now this word for God is not the covenant word for God. It is a word uh, that is more, um, it's, it's, a, it's a plural world, plural word. Uh, it's Elohim. Um, and yes, biblical scholars out there, oh yes, Elohim, uh, the im ending, 
does mean it's plural. Uh, and this is sometimes where some scholars and certain ilks will say, well, there's the Trinity. Because Elohim, it means more than one. It's not just a singular, it is a plural. So, oh, there you go. There's your Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Elohim. No, it's a nice try, but it's not really there. Um, Elohim um, is uh, really the word uh, meaning more like divinity. Um, it's not a personal name for God. It's just a name uh, that we, that the biblical writer calls, uh, uses for God, Elohim. But it doesn't, it's not a covenant name for God. I like it because, uh, because I think it does lend to our Trinitarian theme in that it doesn't, it's, it doesn't talk of the, the, the Father, Son, or the Spirit, but just the, the, nature of, the nature of God is that God is one who brings order that says, let there be. And this is a very kingly kind of telling, is it not? Look at this. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is what you do. If you're the king and you say, bring me my whatever, and they bring it, it's like, that's what kings do. Well, this is a very kingly, a very royal description of the way God acts. Just with the word, oh, the word, interesting, the word, isn't that what the Gospel of John writer used in speaking of the pre-existent Christ, Jesus? Yeah, remember where he says, in the beginning was what? I'm talking about John 1, 1 here. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, oh, was God. So here we see God creating with Word. And it's very, here's another possible Trinitarian um, thing uh, that you can go to. It's like, Oh, well, there's no talk of son, the son, as in the son, uh, the father, son, the Lord. No talk of the son, S-O-N, but there is the use of word. And word creates world. Word creates world. One of the things that we get in other scriptures, we're not gonna cover any of those today, is that uh, Jesus, the Christ, as the word of God was present in creation. Uh, if not the actual agent of creation, other scripture texts, we, we're not gonna talk about those today, but the fact that we see this Elohim using words to create world, this is where we get a little bit of a Trinitarian perspective. Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So uh, notice uh, there was evening and morning, evening and morning. Oh, why was it evening and morning? He creates light but the evening is first in the Jewish calendar to this day. Nightfall, night is actually the beginning of the new day. And day, once the light goes down, that's the end of the day. God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the... The, and there was, it's, it's always evening and then morning. Evening and then morning. It's a reminder that darkness and chaos always precedes light and order. Darkness and chaos, light and order. Darkness and chaos, light and order. Light and order always wins. Always wins. 
It always starts out with darkness and disorder, but it ends with light and order. Every day does that. So Annie was right. The sun will come out. Indeed. Verse 6. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky. Uh, and, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So this thing about the sky, um, so if you can imagine uh, this watery chaos, darkness, 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 watery chaos, and God slips the, a firmament, like, like just something solid in the midst of all of this watery chaos. And it's almost like, if you can imagine, it's almost as though uh, uh, it's like a, 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 like a balloon. If you can imagine a balloon, um, if you were to put a, 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 like a, like a, like a, a popsicle stick in a balloon and uh, put it in uh, 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 water, and then you um, blow up that balloon, what have you created? You've created a, uh, a space. There's still water above and below and around. But there is a dome now. There is a, a, uh, a spot where there's separation. There's a spot where there's no chaos. There's chaos all around. But there is no chaos in this little place where we have separated the waters from the waters. This is sky. Some people call it the creation of like, like heaven. But this is an old world cosmology here, okay? And this is not a flat earth thing. This is not, um, this is not a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a picture that we get from the moon. Um, this is just an old world cosmology, the old dome, the old dome. Uh, of, uh, I, I like the picture of a, um, you know, those, uh, you know, those snow globes, you know, those snow globes and you will shake, but how are they? It's a little flat thing. It's a, usually a circle or a rect or a, uh, or an oval a circle or an oval. And then there's this dome. Um, and then you, of course there's all, of course there's water inside this little snow globe. But, um, but, but that's kind of a picture of what creation looks like above the dome and below is the is where the waters are verse 9 and god said let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so god called the dry land earth and water and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and god saw that it was good so even in this firmament of this 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 uh, this, uh, this uh, dome, um, it still doesn't. Uh, there, there hadn't been uh, on day two. There hadn't been like dry land. It was just it's just a space. That's why I used the illustration of the balloon. I said to pop a sickle stick, but that's only so you can stick the balloon in in the water. But no, but that's not actually that. Blow up that little. That's what it is. It's not until verse 9 that we actually have uh, the dry land appearing and the waters the, the idea is that the waters are recede and there is land to be revealed then God said let the earth put forth vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with seed in it and it was so the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, trees of every living bearing fruit with seed of it in it. And so God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. So um, the idea that there's, um, there's, uh, there's, there's food now um, the, uh, with, the, with the dry land. Notice there's no mention of animals yet. Of course, not people. But there is life as we know it with 
vegetation. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the, light, the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights. The greater light he called, the greater light, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So what do we have here? Uh, the, 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 he's, we're talking about the sun and the moon. Uh, the stars are, uh, as we know, other suns. This isn't a scientific explanation. This is a theological explanation. It is primarily trying to answer this question. Well, a couple of questions. Eh. Three questions. Who is God? That's question one. What is creation? That's question two. And the third correct, uh, question is, well, what's God's relationship to creation? So those are the questions that are being answered. It's not trying to answer how old is the earth. It's not trying to answer is my bi biology teacher correct? <clears throat> is my astronomy teacher correct? Is science correct? No, I'm not answering those questions. You know why? Science didn't exist back then. Hello, there was no such thing as science. This is a theological explanation, a way to present God as a very authoritative figure using word to create world. So these lights that are, uh, so remember, um, you should be thinking, okay, wait a second. This is the fourth day of creation. Uh, hello, God already created light. Yeah, ver ver chapter one, verse three, or no, verses four, five, and six, uh, four and five. That was day one. God saw that the light, God created light, but yet we don't get luminaries isn't that interesting? That light was invented before luminaries. Now, as far as we know, our scientific mindset tells us there is no light without luminaries. You gotta light a match, you gotta light a candle, you gotta turn on the light bulb, you gotta stoke up the fire, you gotta light your little lantern. There's no light without luminaries in the scientific mindset. So the Bible tells us itself. It informs us in, 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 at the very beginning saying, okay, this is not a scientific explanation. And if you try to make it that, you're really going to go down the wrong path. Day one, God creates light. God doesn't create luminaries, lights, those things that we see as giving us light. Uh, where does our light come from? Well, we know it comes from the sun. Well, we've invented diet of things that create light, right? But light, the idea, it's a theological principle, folks. When chaos and darkness rule, the only thing that can make a difference is light, and that comes from God. God's activity is what puts an end to chaos. So anytime, and I said this earlier, I'm gonna say it again, so anytime there's chaos in the world, and you, chaos, you know what's included in chaos? Injustice, any kind of injustice, any kind of malfeasance, any kind of inhumanity to fellow man, any kind of uh, lawlessness impacted or enacted by anyone, all of that is an example of chaos. 
of uncreatedness. Of, oh, there's a little leak. There's a little leak in creation. That's an example of not God. Only when we see order restored. Only when we see justice return to everyone does God's presence truly impact the world. Yeah, all this is from the creation story. How do you like that? So, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, I love this. Oh, and the stars. Oh, and the stars. You know, the luminaries of the heavens, the greater light, the lesser light, the stars that are mentioned here in the uh, fourth day of creation, all of those things, you know what? Um, those are the things that other religions loved to worship. They loved to worship those things. One of the points of our writer is that those are created things of our God, not things to be worshipped. We worship the creator of those things. That's the difference between that religion that we express and espouse. All right, how about, let's go, how about day five? Let's go to day five. Day five, day five. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth and let there, and there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. So this is a correspondence. Just, so just as um, day four was a corresponding verse to, uh, to day one, Day five is a corresponding verse to what happened on day two. Remember what happened on day two? That's when the, day, that's when the dome was created in the midst. Well, the waters that are in the createdness have living things in them. The dry land, the air gets filled, that air, that air bubble, birds. So there's living, there's life in this bubble. Sixth day, let's go to day six. And God said, let the, uh, verse 20, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so, God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of the earth of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind. See, we're moving on. So in, on the sixth day, He's going to create not just the animals. Okay, now this corresponds to what happened on day three. What happened on day three? Look back on day three. Oh, oh, that's when um, dry land appeared. And that's when there was vegetation. So there were plants. So there was food there. So the idea that, that there was food there and then you put the, peop the, the things on it that are to, to, to consume the food. Oh, and by the way, the, oh, and you're, we're gonna see this in a little bit. <laughs> the idea is that uh, the food that was provided was the food that got provided on the third day. It's interesting, let's, let's well, we'll, we'll read on. Uh, we'll read on. Okay, verse 26, we're uh, in day six of creation here. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let, there's, oh, there's that plural, ah, us, let us do this, let our likeness. That's where uh, people get a little hints of like, oh, is that Trinity, is that, what's that, is that Trinity, is that what's going on, a little Trinity thing there? Like I said, the word for God is Elohim, it is plural. It doesn't necessarily mean gods, but it does speak to the royal nature and corporate nature of God. Whenever we see God or think of the word God, we have to remember that that word God incorporates Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Creator is not the Father. 
creator is God, Elohim. All of, all of, all of that we know that God is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is a way of uh, differentiating it in, in, in our Christian uh, context. But God, God, that's all of that. There's no separation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, God said, let us make humankind in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God. Oh, what interesting. In the image of God, he created them. In the image of Elohim, in the image of divinity. Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created them. Male, oh, male and female, he created them. So in this creation story, male and female is distinguished as both aspects. All, all of that is an aspect of what God is. There's no gender that is closer to being like God than the other. No gender is either closer Neither one of them. They are a male and female are the uh, expressions that we see in our mindsets, in our, in our polarizing, polarizing mindsets. We, create, we, we separate the two as n n one has nothing to do with the other. And no, both are expressions of who God is. And guess what? We all know that in the world of sexuality, there's a continuum of male to female. It's a, it, and it's all inside of who God is. There's no gender in, on that male-female continuum. No gender that is closer to God than other. They, it's all an expression of God from one to the other. All right, verse 26, God blessed them. No, verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So it's even though it says that uh, God gives us, God gives created humanity a dominion over uh, the birds and all that, everything, it, it doesn't, we're not really told what dominion means. Um, yeah. But notice that what we, what is specifically, what we're specifically doing. And I'm just talking about what the text says, okay? God said, look, verse nine. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. <laughs> That's interesting. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So the idea, it's like uh, the, on the third day when um, the vegetation appeared, that was when food appeared. And then there was the things that were to eat the food, which is uh, beasts and... Um, and human beings. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, there is, uh, it isn't until later that we find, um, you know, people eating um, animals. There's nothing wrong with eating meat. Um, I just think, I just, I always just find it amusing though, that as far as what the text says, uh, that uh, food is what the earth brings forth in terms of vegetation. And then, uh, and then there's the things that use it for food, which is animals and humans. But um, uh, we're not being told here, we're not being told here that the animals are for food. We end up making them for food and that's okay. Um, it's just that um, it's not really the way it was in Genesis one. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Nothing wrong here. I like my meat. Okay, where did I stop at? And it was good. Okay, verse 31. 
And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Oh, very good. Mm, very good. So everything was declared good. And when everything was done, he says, oh, yeah, it's very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. This is um, a part of this theology of uh, when people talk about original blessing. Uh, a lot of times uh, our theology has gotten stuck in this original sin problem. The idea that, oh, uh, the sinful nature, the way things started out. There was something there that's kind of a little like, eh, that's not original sin. There's really more of an original blessing that's going on. Everything is good. God is declaring everything good. So you gotta remember, the backdrop, I didn't get into this earlier, but the backdrop of the, of the whole creation story, remember I told you, I was trying to answer the question, who is God? Well, God is this kingly uh, presence that can create worlds with word. Who is creation? It's a loving act of a divine God. It's not an accident. Uh, in the old mythologies of the ancient Near East, uh, worlds and humans and the like were all created by despicable acts of uh, incestuous acts between gods and um, uh, uh, um, seriously, like uh, a, a, a like God's vomiting out things and turning those into created beings. It's not, they weren't glorious pictures, okay? Creation had not been put forth as a glorious thing, as an expression of, oh, in the image of God. So who is God? God is one who creates things in his image. God, we are those things that God, as, as a loving expression of God, all of our matter around us. What is creation? What is God's creation to creation? Is that God wants creation, that creation is a, a loving expression of the being of God. It's not something to battle. It's not something that, it, 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 it's, it's a part of what sustains us. It's a part of us. We are a part of it. Our God is, is that good. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. This is uh, chapter two, verse one, and it goes, uh, this, this creation story doesn't conclude until uh, uh, the end of uh, the first half of verse four. <laughs> the monks that did all the translating and, the, and you know, chapter fried, has, what's the word, chap, who put the Bible in the chapters? <laughs> they didn't know this. But the story doesn't actually finish in the first chapter. It goes through the, the first half of verse four of chapter two. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. Oh, and on the seventh day, God <laughs> finished the work. It really like, it's like, it says on the seventh day, God finished the work. It's like, no, he didn't finish it. He actually finished it on the sixth day, right? He actually finished on the sixth day because it says that he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Yeah, so on the seventh day, I think it's better translated in verse two, and on the seventh day, after God had finished the work that he had done, he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So this is where the whole big thing about the Sabbath, the word Sabbath means seventh. Sabbath and seventh, same word, seventh. There's no, the Sabbath is always the seventh day. Sabbath didn't get changed. Sabbath is still Saturday. We don't worship on Saturday. Why? Well, didn't God rest on Saturday? Well, yeah, but... Why do we worship on Sunday? We worship on Sunday because that's the Lord's day. Why is it the Lord's day? It's the Lord's day because that's the day on which we experienced the resurrected Christ. The Lord's day, which is the eighth day. 
So it's kind of a, an eighth day of creation. So yeah, don't get all bent out of shape about seventh and Sabbath and Saturday and when you worship. We worship on Sunday. Why? It's the Lord's day, but it's not the Sabbath. We're supposed to do, well, that's the Sabbath. That's something else. That's not, that's not when we worship. We worship on Sunday, the Lord's day, the day of the resurrection. That's our history. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Notice it, it kind of uh, gives us the impression that it was work for God, which is interesting. Um, you wouldn't think that uh, the speaking, speaking something into existence would be work and that he would even need rest. I don't know if we're supposed to think of God as needing rest. I think it's more of a model for us. The idea that in the pattern of life, well, you've heard it said, all work and no play. <laughs> It's like you've got, there's got to be a time for no work. There's got to be a time for no work. There's got to be a time for rest. That's a hallowed day. Days off are awesome. Verse 4a, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 4a is our last verse in this little thing here. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So yeah, Trinity Sunday, uh, we have this story of the creation. It reminds us of the activity of uh, the word of God, which got manifested in Jesus. And it contains a reminder of the spirit of God, which is a, also a Trinitarian thing. So uh, that's why it's an appropriate text for Trinity Sunday. We want to take from this the idea that chaos is what exists before creation. Anytime we bring order to chaos, anytime we bring peace to injustice, anytime we bring justice to, pe to, uh, to uh, criminality, any kind of criminality, Take your pick of the criminality you're seeing in the world. All of it. All of it. Whether it be racial or otherwise. All criminality is an example of chaos. Order is what God brings. Anytime there is, anytime chaos reigns, the rule of God is not being followed. Anytime there is injustice, the rule of God is not, it's all, all of the chaos, whether it's, it's, whether it's uh, uh, crime by a policeman on, 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 uh, on uh, people uh, in, in crowds or against uh, a white policemen on, on black uh, suspects, it's all the same thing. And the uh, reaction uh, uh, of, of criminal acts of, uh, of violence and destruction, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing to God. There's no like, oh, well, this is, a, this, is a, this is even a worse crime than that. No, no, it's not. When chaos reigns, God, God's uh, rule is, is not in order. Anytime there is injustice, God's rule is not in order. All of that has to be fixed. Everything that we see today. If anybody, anybody who polarizes what's happening today, whether we're talking about uh, white on black violence in, with policemen or with criminal activity based from rioter, rioters, guess what? All of that is an example of chaos and injustice and we as Christians should be crying out, not picking partisan sides, but we gotta cry out for the justice that God wants in the earth, justice. 
Well, there's my little pulpit sermon today. I hope, uh, I hope you have a good Trinity Sunday. Um, I'll see you uh, next time. Bye-bye.